Chapter One of the Indians of Carlsbad Caverns National Park. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Indians of Carlsbad Caverns National Park by Jack R. Williams. Chapter One The Indians of Carlsbad Caverns National Park the indian story of the park is quite complicated for several reasons first we cannot confine our stories to the man-made boundaries of today, but to the natural geographic features which are mainly the guadalupe mountains second we must deal with more than one group of people and outside cultural influences of each group these groups however will be confined mostly to new mexico and north and west texas then too long periods of time must be taken into consideration so let us start our story with man's first entry into the new world some fifteen to twenty five thousand years ago most archaeologists agree that man came from asia via the bering straits perhaps by a land bridge or over the ice undoubtedly many migrations over a long period of time were made by various small groups of peoples these first people were nomadic followers of game and perhaps gatherers of seeds steadily moving southward they eventually reached what is now southeastern new mexico and north and west texas how long they lived here where they went and who their ancestors were are unknown theory plus material evidence suggests that they may have evolved into what archaeologists call the cochise complex to basket maker to pueblo with deviations in all groups yet at the present time there is not enough evidence this last happened that simply so we shall attempt to present the evidence as interpreted for each group or groups coming into contact with carlsbad caverns national park and adjacent areas there appears to be a long time lag between early man and our next group the basket makers positive proof indicates that the basket makers were here before nine hundred a d and possibly as early as four thousand years ago our basket makers which are not to be confused in any manner with the san juan basket makers were a rather isolated group and tended to remain that way through numerous outside influences while pueblo groups to the west and north were progressing in agriculture architecture and aesthetic arts our group because of their environment remained more or less stable in their mode of life hunter and gatherers of seeds in an area totally unsuitable for agriculture next to enter our area were the apaches from the north after thirteen hundred a d question mark whether they exerted pressure on the basket makers we do not know after the apaches acquired horses from the spanish thus making them mobile different groups moved to other parts of new mexico and arizona branching to the south and southeast were the mescalero and lipan bands the mescalero band settled in an area which included the guadalupe mountains and surrounding districts whence they raided the pueblo indians and the spanish until about seventeen twenty five when another plains group the comanches came into the country from the northeast by pushing the apaches north and west the comanches controlled a tremendous portion of the southern plains quite probably all of the mentioned indian groups knew of the entrance to the carlsbad caverns however physical evidence that they did was left by only one group the basket makers on the south wall of the natural entrance may be seen pictographs or paintings of some weather-worn figures in red ochre and black probably carbon on the surface just above the cave mouth is a distinct midden circle or cooking pit many of these midden circles were found throughout the entire area and will be explained more fully in the chapter on the carlsbad basket makers there is little physical evidence that any of the indians went into the cave beyond the entrance which they obviously used as a means of shelter it is very unlikely that they ventured beyond the now back cave section of the cave for several logical reasons light is a paramount factor in cave exploration and the indians only means of light would have been rather crude torches of bark grass or wood none of which gives off much light nor burns for any appreciable length of time 
probably the young and agile only would attempt the precarious descent if only to break the humdrum of everyday existence upon first viewing the cavern's entrance one readily notices the steep slope downward and the sheer drop to the floor of the back cave section and how at the bottom of this drop there is built up a sizable pile of rubble from this rubble and the back guano deposits that led away from it in all directions have come numerous skeletal remains burnt and worked stone and fragments of woven articles such as bags sandals and baskets burials were also found in the small solution pockets or holes seen in the vicinity of the paintings in the entrance proper the indians living any length of time in this area were concerned primarily with obtaining food and this was a constant struggle so from this practical point of view they wouldn't have any business going into what we now call the scenic sections of the cave on the other hand we cannot say they did not go down because we know man's curiosity can get the better of him sometimes it is very logical to assume that over the long period of time man has been in and around the area someone climbed down and looked some people are of the assumption that the superstitious nature of the indians kept them out of the cave true man has always been somewhat afraid of the dark and will probably always be so that the indians were superstitious of the bats which fly out of the entrance each summer evening in search of night-flying insects is very questionable first of all if the people were afraid of the bats they would not have lived under the entrance overhang this writer could find only one instance where bats were regarded other than little brothers and this was a myth among the guiana indians of south america that concerned big bats that suck humans dry of blood and also a large bat that would carry people off the bats and night owls raided together but the people overcame their fear and killed them animals did not as a rule inhabit the cavern so the indians would not be down there hunting animals did from time to time stumble in and in nineteen forty six there was found the skeletal remains of an extinct ground sloth underneath the entrance have been found skeletons of many small animals that died either from the fall or starvation thus we cannot say that the indians went into the cave any distance nor can we say that they did not simply because we do not know to fully understand and appreciate the story of any group or groups of people one must be acquainted somewhat with the country in which they lived the country inhabited by the indians of carlsbad caverns national park has a wide temperature and altitude range and four life zones upper and lower sonoran canadian and transition the guadalupe mountains developed from a limestone reef laid down in a shallow sea during the permian period of the earth's history over two million years ago they are cut with many deep canyons containing numerous caves but have little permanent water plant and animal life are abundant and varied due mainly to the lack of water agriculture was not practiced in this particular area the economy was one known as hunting and gathering perhaps a brief description of each group that lived hunted and visited in this area will best picture how and why they did end of chapter one chapters two and three of the indians of carlsbad caverns national park by jack r williams this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two early man about all we can say for early man and the park is that he was here the only material remains found was a folsom like projectile point this point was discovered in burnett cave in the guadalupe mountains in direct association with extinct animal bones what he looked like we have no idea but he was apparently a nomadic hunter and follower of game because he followed game is probably the main reason he arrived here from asia in late pleistocene times fifteen to twenty five thousand years ago he hunted the now extinct bison antiquius two species of the american horse equius fraternus and equius clampacladus 
a rare four-horned antelope tetrameryx the california condor camel ground sloth and a muskox or caribou-like animal butherium species undoubtedly these old ones utilized plants for food too it is safe to assume that he dressed in skins if he dressed at all whether caves were used as shelter we do not know but quite probably they were as the climate was pluvial the method of projection for the point mentioned likely was done either via a lance or the atlatl spear thrower and dart the latter is nothing more than a stick with a knock for the dart at one end it extends and gives more leverage to the arm for throwing where did he go some call him Folsom man others say he is of the cochise complex he may have stayed where his descendants later became what we now call the basket makers end of chapter two chapter three the carlsbad basket makers the true occupants of Carlsbad Caverns National Park were a group of Indians known as basket makers. They may have been descendants of the early people, or perhaps a new and distinct group. This name was applied because these people made excellent baskets and other woven objects, and had some similarity in culture traits to the San Juan basket makers or Anasazi of the Four Corners area moreover there is some similarity in culture traits to the big bend basket makers of texas and the ozark bluff dwellers perhaps the name best suited for this group would be cave dwellers as they used caves of all sizes from small overhangs to those of huge proportions for shelter yet it must be remembered that seasonally they lived in the open however to avoid later confusion we shall refer to them as the carlsbad basket makers the carlsbad basket makers were an unusual group only here and there adopting a few cultural traits from their neighbors but essentially remaining food gatherers and hunters a rather simple state of culture as compared to their contemporaries our group was in contact with the Mogollon people to the west before 900 A.D., and possibly 600 years earlier. Pottery found here indicates this as well as other contacts. Pottery is somewhat like a fingerprint. There are certain features about it which are peculiar to only one particular area, and that is the area within which it was made. Consequently, pottery can show time, trade, contact, and movement of ceramic-making prehistoric people. At about this same time, social intercourse was also being carried on with the Hueco basket-makers to the west and the Big Bend basket-makers to the south. After 1200, we find Chaco, or true Anasazi influence, coming into the Rio Grande Valley to Gran Quivera, thence to southeastern new mexico this influence represents the pueblo indians who apparently changed the carlsbad basket makers way of life more than any other this continued until some time between fifteen hundred and sixteen hundred when a drastic and complete change came over all the aboriginal peoples in this area the spanish entered the southwest bringing the horse which prompted this change the apaches had slowly been working their way southward from some time after thirteen hundred a d by trade and theft they acquired horses from the spanish and in so doing the long and bloody career of the apaches got under way this freedom and rapidity of movement afforded by the horse allowed them to raid pillage and murder indians and spanish alike it is about this time that we lose track of our basket makers what happened to them is pure supposition the carlsbad basket makers for defense or economic reasons probably joined the pueblo groups of either the gran quivera or el paso areas and became completely absorbed many pueblo traits found here contribute to this supposition such as pottery changes and physical changes of the people themselves for example the early carlsbad basket makers were long-headed individuals dolichocephalic 
Near the end of their era, the head shape changed by artificial deformation or flattening brought about by the use of a hard cradle board to a broad head or brachycephalic type. All along the line there was an admixture of physical types, with the three types being present, long, medium, mesocephalic, and broad. The Carlsbad basket maker would very likely fit into practically any present Pueblo group and not be noticed. He was of medium stature, about five foot four to five foot six in average height. His lifespan was between thirty and thirty-five years, and he suffered from arthritis, bad teeth, and broken bones quite often. The material culture of a people is perhaps their most important characteristic, as it represents the utilization of the natural resources in a particular area or environment. Caves were used for a number of purposes, burial, ceremonial, transitory living, etc. It is from these caves that archaeologists dig out the material objects left by prehistoric people and are able to reconstruct the story of the occupants. As previously mentioned, the name of our Carlsbad Caverns National Park Indians was applied because they made excellent baskets and woven objects. Coiled baskets of yucca with grass, sotol, or twigs of flexible wood as the binder were the most common. Most baskets have designs of various colors woven into them. Red-brown dye was probably made from mountain mahogany. The black was strips of devil's claw, Martinia arenaria. Baskets were waterproof by smearing pitch pine or mesquite gum on them. Sandals of yucca and grasses are found in abundance. The square-toed sandal is the most prominent, although the round fish-tailed type is common both were woven with a variety of ply thicknesses they ranged from five to eleven inches in length and two and a half to four inches in width the only known sandal fragment found in the natural entrance to the caverns is of the square-toed type and is classed as a two warp two ply yucca seems to have been the most used plant for weaving maps of yucca and bear grass were woven in a variety of ways a coarse cloth netting and cordage of yucca fiber was used for snaring rabbits and other small game and large bags of yucca fiber cordage were made for burial purposes these cone-shaped twine woven bags were sometimes quite elaborately woven of red and white cords with horizontal black and yellow bands running completely around them cotton was grown to the west and some combination of cotton and yucca fabrics was made here clothing or blankets of animal fur usually rabbit and feather turkey cloth was common this turkey cloth was probably traded from the pueblos two plain fur cloth and skin robes were used for covering hair was woven into rope as were mesquite fiber and agave raw material apparently kept on hand as fiber bundles and rings of grass were common finds v-shaped cradles were made of grass and sleeping pits were lined with it pottery is really incidental and for the most part intrusive to southeastern new mexico it is questionable if the area inhabitants made pottery but they probably did to some extent there is found a considerable amount of plain brown ware, and it occurs from early to late times. This ware, although unnamed except for plain brown, is thought to be of local manufacture. Practically all pottery found here was fired in the presence of oxygen, oxidizing atmosphere. A number of types, varying in color from a terracotta through brown to reddish tones, are all classed as brown ware the earliest pottery found in southeastern new mexico is magian in origin magian pottery is a derivative from southwestern new mexico and southeastern arizona the magian brown and red wares found in this section are definitely pre 900 a d and possibly pre 700 these wares are found to have been used through 1150 a d the big influx of pottery came during late Pueblo III and Pueblo IV times from 1150 to 1450 A.D. 
From the west came Mimbe's black on white, which dates from 1050 to 1200 A.D., Hornada brown, El Paso polychrome, and brown wares. From the north, northwest, and west, because of Pueblo expansion, came Three Rivers Red in Terracotta, St. John's polychrome from the Zuni area, Chupadero black on white from Gran Quivira, Lincoln black on red, and Rio Grande glaze wares. It is interesting to note that pottery changes in this area parallel those of the Mohollon to some degree. Our basket makers were dependent primarily upon wild plant foods, as corn seems to be lacking, and they supplemented their diet by some hunting of game. To the south of the park is the Black River. In this fertile valley, with its continuous water supply, it is logical to assume that corn was probably cultivated, but there is absolutely no evidence to prove this. Corn was grown about fifty miles north, near Hope, New Mexico, where Pueblo-like settlements were common from 1150 to 1300 A.D. Corn, beans, and squash may have been traded to our cave people by the Pueblos. Lack of practiced agriculture in the Guadalupe Mountains was probably due to the scarcity of water. Water from seeps, springs, and shallow depressions in the limestone was, of course, utilized. The roasted young bud and heart of the mezcal or agave plant apparently was the paramount food, with the cabbage-like base or heart of the sotol running a close second. Yucca pulp and seeds, mesquite beans, tornillo or screw bean, grass seeds, pinion nuts, acorns, walnuts, cactus fruits, prickly pear and choya, wild onions, wild potatoes, and other bulb or tuber-bearing plants grapes berries and others were utilized herbs from true sagebrush artemisia wild tobacco and a possibly soap made from the roots of the yucca radiosa were used a favorite quick food was the young flower stalks of yucca in season mescal hearts and baked soto leaves were stored in caves in cysts lines with grass twigs and bark stone slab lined storage cysts were known also Mesquite beans were pulverized into meal as substantiated by the many mortar holes throughout the area. The meal was probably fashioned by pounding the beans and pods together, winnowing out the pods, grinding until fairly uniform, and eating them either raw or molded into cakes and cooked in ashes or into soups. Gourds were used for a household receptacle, probably as a label or dipper. The entire country is dotted with large midden circles. The one most seen by visitors is located at the natural entrance. For years, these circles have erroneously been called mescal pits and were thought to have been used strictly for baking or roasting the mescal plant by both our basket makers and later the Apaches. In remote instances, it is possible that the Apaches used them, but not as a common practice. The main difference between the basket maker midden circle and the Apache mescal pit is that the true mescal pit or earth oven is a depression definitely sunk below the ground level, whereas the midden circle is on ground level. Consequently, the midden circle had other uses than the preparation of mescal hearts. There are three types of midden circles. The most common is the circular mound, which is found up to an altitude of 7,500 feet and out considerable distances into the flats. It is of interest to note that no midden circles of the Carlsbad basket makers are found east of the Pecos River. The circular ones will average from 30 to 35 feet in diameter in this area. The first stage of development seems to have begun with the construction of a fireplace composed of fairly large rocks. When heat had cracked these into fragments too small to be useful, the broken bits were then cleared away from a circle about the fire and the hearth rebuilt with other large stones, which in turn were discarded when broken down by heat. When this process had been repeated many times, the cleared circle immediately around the fire was surrounded by a ring formed by an accumulation of the rejected small stones. 
In course of time, and with constant additions of ash and discarded rock, the resulting mound grew to such height that it might even have proved serviceable as a windbreak. That such a method was employed seems quite probable, because all the stones composing the outer ring show hard firings, while scattered through the masses are found ashes and rejecta of a camp. If this hypothesis is accepted, a large number of these structures would indicate an extended occupation or perhaps repeated occupation over a comparatively long period. The second type is found on ledges or narrow terraces along canyon walls and was elongated in shape. The third is built out in front of caves and shelters and takes on a rough half-circle shape. The mescal pit, as used by the Apaches, is described in their section. Practically all game was hunted, notably mule deer, elk, and buffalo, and next, if not the most important, rabbits, both the cottontail and jackrabbit. Also antelope, plains white-tailed deer, bighorn sheep, peccary, javelina, mountain lion, bobcat, wolf, fox, coyote, badger, porcupine, ring-tailed cat, opossum, prairie dog, armadillo, pack rat, kangaroo rat, muskrat, field mouse, white foot mouse, beaver, pocket mouse, ground squirrel, pocket gopher, as well as fish, ducks, hawks, owls, quail, desert tortoise, pigeons, doves, large terrapin, lizards, and snakes were utilized. Our people had the dog and probably ate him in time of famine. Although some turkey bones have been found, it is quite certain that this bird was not domesticated here as it was among the Pueblos. Needless to say, leather was fashioned from the skins of practically all animals and was used for pouches, snares, and so forth. Usually the first thing to enter our minds when stone is mentioned in connection with aboriginal peoples is arrowheads or projectile points. Stone was used for many and varied purposes, and it would be difficult to list these in order of importance. Projectile points were, of course, important, though used primarily for hunting rather than warfare. Points of various sizes, shapes, and materials were used by the Carlsbad basket makers. First were the dart and lance points, and later as arrow points after the introduction of the bow to the southwest. Flints, cherts, and chalcedonies were the most common materials used for points and small tools, although rhyolite, felsite, etc. have been found. Stone was worked by grinding, pecking, drilling, and percussion and pressure flaking. Mortars were usually cut into stationary rock near camping places, such as those seen near the natural entrance to the caverns, although small portable mortars were used to some extent. The pestles were usually made of granite and were carried from camp to camp, as pestles with yucca leaf carrying straps have been found. Metates, or grinding bowls, are less common. Metates were made from limestone, sandstone, and granite, while the mano, the small stone used for crushing and grinding on the metate, was composed of limestone, granite, and travertine. The metates are oval, circular, and semi-flat in appearance, and the manos are of one-hand type. Leaf-shaped knives, end scrapers, side scrapers, drills, choppers, hammer stones, rubbing or smoothing stones, axes, and stone pipes were made and used. Found throughout the Guadalupe Mountains, sometimes at the head of canyons, usually on the canyon floors, are small stone cairns and stone rings or circles. To date, no feasible explanation is given as to their function. These are not to be confused with the midden circles previously mentioned. For other than fuel, wood was widely used as clubs, digging sticks, atolls, darts, spear foreshafts, bows, arrows, projectile points, fire sets, drill and hearth, seed storage tubes, fending sticks, throwing sticks, rabbit sticks, and wooden stoppers for canteens. Woodworking with stone tools consisted of seven methods, chopping, whittling, shaving and planing, sawing, splitting, gouging and scoring, scraping, and sanding. Fire was made with the use of a wooden hearth. 
Friction was created by revolving the point of a stick with the hands in a small depression in the hearth, which contained tinder of punk wood, shredded inner bark, or grass. Cedar or juniper bark was probably used for torches. Animal bone was used for awls, stone flaking tools, jewelry ornaments, and weaving tools animal horn or antler was used much the same there is a slight possibility that bone gaming dice were made and used as perhaps were horn ladles and dippers in earlier times our basket makers used the atlal as their predominant weapon or hunting implement it was composed of two parts the stick for throwing the dart and the dart itself later the bow and arrow replaced this implement in importance atolls were from nineteen to twenty five inches in length and were made of oak mesquite thorn growth of tornillo sinew and buckskin occasionally a small stone was attached to add weight and balance atoll dart shafts consisted of two parts the fore shaft was of heavy oak or comparatively hard wood with a stone point this was inserted into the main shaft of sotol bloom stalks the idea being upon impact that the base would fall away from the fore shaft thus allowing full penetration and less chance of the animal or man knocking or pulling it out both the atoll and dart shafts were sometimes highly decorated a variety of stone points were used, as was the dart boont, which possibly was used as a stunner as its appearance suggests. The dart boont was a round wooden knob carved to insert into the main shaft. Bows and arrows were made of varied hardwoods and reeds. Bows had an average pull of about 40 pounds and were from three and a half to five feet in length arrows were twenty to twenty-eight inches long and the bowstring was either yucca fiber or sinew the lance or spear ordinary stick clubs grooved fending sticks round fending sticks flattened and round throwing sticks found may also have been used as weapons disposition of the dead was accomplished by burying with offerings in a flexed or semi-flexed position on the back or cremated with the burned remains being buried in bags or baskets the graves are usually small and quite shallow burials are found in caves midden circles and open sites practically any place where digging was easy quite often the unburned burials had a kill hole pottery bowl inserted over the face cremation from all appearances was practiced earlier and was concurrent to inhumation the few skeletal remains found in the natural entrance and back cave section of the carlsbad caverns suggest midden type burials or accidental demise perhaps by falling possibly one of the most interesting and still visible bits of evidence of the carlsbad basket makers are the pictographs or paintings on the south wall of the cave entrance these markings are badly weathered but one can distinguish what appears once to have been a red figure with black upraised arms of a person and blobs of red and black which may have been anything in other caves over the area have been found other pictographs paintings and petroglyphs pecked designs paints were made from red hematite red oxide of iron red and yellow ochres blue and green from copper carbonates azurite and malachite black carbon and white kaolinite occasionally there are found small pebbles with painted designs or lines on them but their function is unknown jewelry consisted of wooden combs and wooden pin hair ornaments beads and pendants of white and pink shell gypsum black bidolite turquoise bone squash seeds and sections of reeds beads were strung on hair cord or yucca fiber cord bracelets of glittimeris shell were worn for the most part the shell tells of considerable trade to the gulf of mexico and the gulf of california by our people freshwater mussel shells common to the pecos river were also used for ornaments 
trade was carried on from mexico into this general region as indicated by the finds of copper bells and macaw parrot feathers from pueblo ruins in southern new mexico ceremonial paraphernalia finds are rather rare fragments of a golden eagle feather headdress rattles of gourds and turtle or tortoise shells paus prayer sticks wooden wands and wooden painted tablitas headdresses have been unearthed in guadalupe mountain caves closely related to ceremonial purposes and usually found in close connection with the above are reed cigarettes and whistles prayer offerings of miniature fending sticks fiber balls gaming dice sticks or counters as well as possible ceremonial bow sets as to how the ceremonial objects were used is naturally conjecture end of chapter three Chapter 4 of The Indians of Carlsbad Caverns National Park by Jack R. Williams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Mescalero Apaches. From the north they came, this much we know, and comparatively recently. About 600 years ago, many tribes of Apaches slowly worked their way southward, following the game and gathering the wild plant food, eventually ranging over a great land area from the Pecos River on the east to the borders of the Papago country in southern Arizona on the west, from Colorado to northern Mexico to the Gulf of Mexico in Texas the apaches members of the athabascan linguistic family were first recorded historically on the southern plains by the spanish in fifteen forty forty one who called them Cairico. however it is entirely possible the cabeza de baca in fifteen thirty four thirty five encountered them the mescalero lipan and tuetene a hybrid of the former two were living in this area at that time they were first called Apaches in 1598 by Oñate. The Mescalero Apaches ranged from the Rio Grande to the Staked Plains and were closely allied with both the western Apache groups and tribes of the southern plains. The Narohene or Nachin Mescal people or Water Willow people, as they called themselves, were composed of three bands, the Kaoane, Nihane, and Huscane the niahane band lived in the sacramento guadalupe sierra blanca and capitan mountains an area that included what is now carlsbad caverns national park their name means a people of the terraced mountains to the south of this band were the tuetenes and southeast of them in the big bend country lived the lipan apaches a true plains indian group in order to avoid confusion between the various apache tribes and bands to frequent the area of carlsbad caverns national park the term mescalero will be used it should be pointed out that actually very little is known about this group so the material presented is far from complete and is only general information although of a warlike nature the mescaleros were never considered as dangerous as their brethren farther west yet after acquiring horses from the spanish they raided and warred until about eighteen seventy five when subdued and the mescalero reservation was established in the white mountains northeast of the white sands in new mexico culturally speaking the mescaleros lipans and their hybrid the tuetenes were basically plains with some western apache traits common only to the mescaleros actual physical evidence left by the mescalero apaches in carlsbad caverns national park is scant their most prominent calling card is found in a small cave in west slaughter canyon about four and a half miles from the mouth of the canyon some sixty-five feet above the dry stream bed is the painted grotto this little cave is approximately fifty-seven feet across the front twenty-one feet at the deepest point and the ceiling slopes from sixteen feet at the front to about six feet at the back on the walls and ceiling are several hundred multicolored pictographs all painted with earth ground ochres in red yellow white golden yellow and shades of pink 
Caves of this type were used as shrines or media for ceremonies or religious dances, incantations, etc., and are considered very sacred. This bit of evidence definitely establishes the mescalero on the park proper, and a legend handed down to the modern Apaches indicated that they knew of the main cavern's entrance as well. This legend tells of a medicine man who went into the cave to make big medicine. Supposedly he was last seen wandering away from the entrance, beating his tom-tom, and yearly on the anniversary of this exploit the Apaches would come to the entrance to leave offerings of food for him. The Mescaleros were attracted to the Guadalupe Mountains area due to the abundance of plant and animal life and many springs found there. The cooking of their favorite food, the mezcal, arouses some curiosity. Found throughout the region are remains of the Carlsbad basket maker's midden circles, previously mentioned. In remote instances, perhaps, the Apaches cooked in these so-called mezcal pits. Quite likely, though, they cooked on the surface without the aid of a pit. Today, in many places around the ridges, can be seen spaces of ground devoid of vegetation covered with rocks which have obviously been broken from fire. The Chiricahua Apaches to the west tell of a method of baking mezcal without digging a pit. Rocks are heated and scattered on the level ground. The mezcal crowns are put on them, and fresh grass and dirt are piled over all. This oven has the appearance of a mound when in use, but after the mezcal is removed and time has elapsed, it would appear to be simply a space of barren ground covered with burnt stones. To the north of the Guadalupe Mountains is found evidence of true Apache mezcal pits, and they are just that, a pit dug into the ground. The pit is dug round about seven feet across and from three to four feet deep. The method of using these pits is as follows. Great fires are first kindled in them, after which heated stones are thrown in. On these stones are laid agave leaves, sometimes to a depth of two to three feet. Fire is kindled over this accumulation, and by action of the heat below and above, the leaves are roasted without being burnt. Fuchs other plants and meats were also cooked in this type oven, and many families could and did cook in one pit at the same time by marking their food in some manner. From twenty-four to thirty-six hours were required to cook the mezcal heart. Mezcal heads baked in this manner are somewhat like candied sweet potatoes. Occasionally the mescaleros farm. Most farming was done to the north of the park, but Rattlesnake Springs, source of the park's water supply, about seven miles south of the cavern's entrance, is said to have been an Apache campsite, and possibly some farming was done there. The Mescalero Apaches show a curious mixture of culture traits, both Plains and Western Apache. Following is a brief summary of some of these that may be of interest. They were great stalkers of game and frequently employed the use of animal mask decoys, driving, game calls, and the running down or wearing out of game. They smoked or flooded rodents from their dens, set snares of rope for game, and hunted from blinds or pits. Communal hunting was supervised by a hunt master, and game such as rabbits, peccary, and buffalo were surrounded by people in a circle and clubbed, shot, or driven to hidden hunters, lassoed, or run over a cliff or bank. Dogs were used for hunting as well as for watchdogs and pets. Religious ceremony was practiced before, during, and after the hunt. Prayers, songs, tobacco, pollen, and meat were offered to the hunt deity, and an amulet for good hunting was worn. The mescaleros did not, as a rule, eat wildcat, wolf, coyote, or turkey vultures. Dogs, hawks, turkeys, and eagles were kept as pets. They were never eaten and were buried at death. Sometimes plucked eagles were released alive. Tortoise, turtles, and fish were eaten. Hardwood digging sticks were used for gathering bulbs, roots, etc., and a special stone knife was used for cutting mescal. Seeds were collected on a blanket and carried in a skin bag. 
Acorns were boiled like beans, parched, never leached, shelled and ground on a matate or stone mortar and stored in a skin bag. The meal was eaten with meat stew. Mesquite and screwbean mesquite pods were pounded either in stone or hide mortars, and the seeds were thrown away, and the pod flour was soaked or boiled, and the juice drunk, eaten as mush, or stored in cake form. Mescal heads were pit-roasted as mentioned. A buffalo shoulder blade was used as a shovel to scoop coals over the pit. The fire was usually lit by a lucky person. The cooked head and leaf bases were pounded and dried on frames and stored dry. Syrup was made from the flowers and the stalk above the head was eaten. Yucca fruit was eaten either cooked on coals or dried, and the root stalk was used for soap. This pertained to practically all of the yucca family. Most cacti fruit and some of the pulp was eaten. Pinion seeds were gathered and eaten raw, roasted, or mashed into a butter. Pinion pitch was chewed as gum. Walnuts, wild plums, cherries, grass seeds, etc., tule, and some greens cooked were used. Fruit juices, mescal, mesquite, and sotal juices were drunk, either fresh or boiled and fermented. In later years a maize wine was made. Salt and honey were gathered and used. Meat was sliced, dried, and made into pemmican, bone marrow extracted, blood boiled in paunch, and sausages were made in gut. Meat food was stored either in skin bag, parflesh, or pot. Little agriculture was practiced, irrigation with ditches from streams was known, farming was confined to the sandy soil in the stream bottom land, all farming was a man's job except the harvest when women helped. A two-handed planting stick was used. Corn was eaten green, roasted or dried, and shelled by women. Two varieties of beans, pumpkin, squash, and gourds were grown. Gourds were used as canteens, dishes, and spoons. Mescal harvest camps were sometimes set up in small caves, but teepees or thatched wickiups were the permanent houses. Teepees were three-pole foundation, buffalo hide with ventilator flaps, faced east or downwind, and had a fireplace and smoke hole in the center. They were pegged to the ground, had a covered door, and a dewcloth inner liner. When moved, they were carried on a travois or drag with horse. Temporary lean-tos, shades, windbreaks, domed sweat houses, log rafts, and log bridges were built and used. Swimming was done only when necessary or when water was available. Grass and agave hairbrushes were made. Horn, wood, and shell were used as containers. Knives, awls, and needles were made from stone and bone. Wood was worked with stone hammers, mauls, axes, and fire. Stone was flaked ground and polished. Fire was made by stone or a pump drill. Bows were made of mulberry, oak, juniper, walnut, and other woods. Bowstrings were made of sinew and vegetable fiber. Arrows of willow and other woods, points were stone. Mescalero arrow points were supposedly stemmed bases or the base was side-notched. These types of projectile points are common to the Carlsbad basket makers, too. So it is impossible to differentiate the two when found. Undoubtedly, those found on the park fit into both cultures. Arrows were feathered with three feathers from the eagle, hawk, turkey, and crow. And arrows were carried in an open-skinned, sewn quiver of deerskin, mountain lion, or wildcat. They were carried on the back, under the arm, or on the belt. Spears, shields, war bonnets, short, plains type, armor of hide and clubs were used in battle. Rabbit sticks of wood and slingshots were also used. Beads and ornaments were of shell, bone, wood, feathers, seeds, claws, and hooves, bear ears, turquoise, redstone, cannel coal, jet, and porcupine quills. Paint from mineral and vegetable sources was used for decorating objects or the body, which was painted primarily to prevent sunburn. 
The hair was worn full length by both men and women, but beard and eyebrows were plucked completely with fingers or tweezers of willow wood. During periods of mourning hair was cropped with a stone knife, sometimes to about the level of the chin by women. Hair was worn loose, tied in a bunch or with headband, in braids, and decorated with pendants, feathers, flowers, etc. Earlobes of children were pierced with a snake-weed stem, and nose straightening was practiced on babies if nose was too broad. There was no cradle deformation of the head known among the mescaleros. Tattooing of the face and arms by these people was quite an ancient practice, and was performed with cactus spines and black mineral pigment only, not charcoal as some tribes might use. Clothing consisted of fur caps, robes, shawls, ponchos, and capes of animal skin, with the hair either on or off the hide, and woven vegetable fibers. Highly painted and fringed buckskin-sleeved shirts were worn by the men. The women wore buckskin gowns or dresses, painted and fringed. Buckskin belts held up a skin wrapped around the waist to serve as a kilt for the men, or skirts of buckskin for the women. Hard-soled moccasins were worn by both sexes, while only the men wore a hip-length buckskin legging. Hide overshoes were used in winter. The winter bed was usually composed of a grass and hide mattress with hide coverings, whereas the summer bed was a willow rack or mat with a rawhide twining bedstead supported by four forked posts covered with skins, plains type. Burdens were transported with the aid of a tump-line backpack or other slings, baskets, gourds, pottery, rawhide or leather bags or containers, and horse travois. Baskets, waterproofed with pitch, mats, cradles, cordage of vegetable and animal materials, including hair and pottery, were manufactured by both men and women. A variety of games were played by all, including foot racing, shinny, hoop, and pole, etc. Gambling by adults was done with a hand game of guessing, with bones, moccasin game, drawstrings, dice, and heads or tails with flat stones, wet or dry. The children played games of war, wrestled, and had toys of guns, dolls, stones, etc., Tobacco was gathered and smoked in an elbow pipe. Both tobacco and pipe were kept in a buckskin bag, which was usually highly decorated. The people assembled at the chief's dwelling or in an open space. Unlike most plains tribes, the mescaleros did not carry a medicine bundle, but carried medicine inside themselves. For music and ceremony there were rattles of gourds or horn, drums of pottery and wood, a musical bow, whistles, and flutes. The calendar was divided into four named seasons, with daily and monthly tallies kept on a notched stick. Counting was done on the fingers, and some observations of astronomy were made. Various colors were symbolic. East was black, south blue, west yellow, and north white. Their god, Nyazin, when coming from or going to the sky, rode on a black ray to the east, on a blue horse to the south, on a yellow sorrel horse to the west, and on a white horse to the north. Mysticism, taboo, and definite procedure governed childbirth, naming, education of the young, marriage, athenal relations, death, mourning, labor by both sexes, slaves, land ownership, personal property, war, scalping, dances, ceremonies, political and clan organizations, peyote, kinship systems, religion, and shaman ritual. Little is known about mescalero pottery except that it was tempered with vegetable material made only by women, fired in an open fire, and made with pointed or rounded bottom for inserting into fire coals, and perhaps decorated with incised marks near the rim on occasion. The knowledge of when this art was first practiced is unknown, but is logically historic and very limited. No known shards of this pottery have been found in the park. 
in eighteen seventy five the mescalero apache reservation was established for the mescalero and lipan tribes but in nineteen thirteen a band of geronimo's chiricahuas was released from fort sill in oklahoma and came to mescalero where they now reside locally there is a rumor that the apaches have a myth concerning the bats of carlsbad caverns the bats are said to be an ancient lost war or hunting party but research has failed to verify this story most of the western apaches regard bat as an excellent horseman the chiricahua apaches say if bat bites you you had better never ride a horse any more if you do ride a horse after being bitten you are just as good as dead they were cautious of bats but not superstitious of them End of chapter four chapter five of the indians of carlsbad caverns national park by jack r williams this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the comanches originally the comanches lived far to the north of southeastern new mexico but about seventeen hundred moved to the south plains by this time they were well adapted to their relatively new life of mobility brought about by the acquisition of horses directly or indirectly and by hook or crook from the spanish with horses it was much easier to follow the buffalo fight their enemies raid and trade comanche is a ute indian word meaning enemy and it is often felt that they found their way to new mexico under the tutelage of the utes yet some time between seventeen forty seven and april seventeen forty nine the two became deadly enemies after seventeen fifty the utes joined the apaches to fight the comanches actually there were about twenty different names given for comanche meaning everything from enemies to snake people the ute definition is more fitting however for from about seventeen o five to eighteen seventy five they raided and fought the spanish utes apaches pueblos texans and the u s army among others they ranged from kansas to mexico in thirteen different bands that they were practical and businesslike is perhaps best shown by their dealings with the french the comanches were first contacted about seventeen twenty five by the french who traded them guns and ammunition yet the comanches would not let the french cross their territory to trade with the apaches and others thus monopolizing the source of firearms the shoshonean speaking people were a true south plains horse indian they were often considered the finest horsemen of the plains these nomadic buffalo hunters who lived in tepees of the skins from this animal the comanche tongue was universally spoken by numerous other indian tribes of the south plains so little sign language was necessary as was the case farther north buffalo were reported on the south plains in fifteen forty forty one by the spanish as there was constant warfare between the comanches and the apaches it may well have started over the bison the words fighting and comanche go hand in hand they were spasmodically at war with most of their neighbors yet if peace and alliance achieved a goal they would concede as is shown in their relationship with the kiowa bitter enemies these two until seventeen ninety when an alliance was made which lasted until some time in the eighteen seventies together they raided the spanish pueblos apaches and their first real enemy the anglo-americans of texas although the park and guadalupe mountains area was not part of the comanche's positive range which lay north east and southeast of the pecos river it was frequently crossed by hunting and raiding parties there is no reason to assume that the kiowas did not accompany them from time to time especially when raiding into mexico these lords of the south plains as they were later called looked and dressed every bit the now hollywood indian 
in costumes of buckskins or buffalo hide decorated with beads and gewgaws wearing the typical war bonnet the comanches ruled a tremendous portion of the south plains for a hundred and seventy-five years they were fearless fighters who rescued their dead and wounded in battle who on occasion used poison from an unknown plant on their arrow points or stuck them in a dead ripe skunk to create the same effect and were great thieves and gamblers the successful theft of horses from the enemy was a high mark of prestige to a man yet this same man could and did lose his spoils to other comanches through the media of dice and hand games the comanches were one of the few tribes of the south plains who did not eat dog or human flesh their religion contained the belief of an afterlife in a happy hunting ground beyond the sun naturally these people utilized many wild plants one among these that grows in the park is mescal which was used as a drug quite a contrast to the apaches this a valiant but bloody chapter in the history of the southwest was closed in june eighteen seventy five when the comanches surrendered to the u s army at fort sill and went on to a reservation in the then indian territory of oklahoma it is said the introduction of the colt revolver in the hands of the texas rangers was the deciding factor toward their surrender end of chapter five end of the indians of carlsbad caverns by jack r williams